Welcome to uh, Chemistry 235. Um, this is the second semester of organic. Um, <clears throat> you should have a copy of the syllabus. You were supposed to print a copy of the slides. Um, the reason that I wanted you to print your copy and not use mine is that um, I gave you guys the big stuff. Okay, so two slides per page um, so you could like see the spectrum. Uh, please um, remember to do this for the next chapter because we'll have even more spectra to look at and they do get really tiny on the little sick per page. So do that. The same as the ones in the book. Nope. 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 Not at all. <clears throat> the textbook for the course um, officially is John McMurray's 8th edition. Um, it's very expensive. Uh, hasn't really changed a whole lot since the 6th edition. Um, either one would work fine. You can get the 6th edition for about 15 bucks online, right? Right. And uh, that, that's a whole lot better than the 200 and something for the 8th uh, edition. And it's really pretty much the same. Chapters are slightly different. The um, NMR section in chapter four, or 13 is uh, more detailed than this one, but we're not going to really do that because this isn't a course in spectroscopy. We're just going to deal with spectroscopy on a very practical level. <clears throat> we also need a lab manual. Lab manual is this thing from 1991. Um, it's old, but it works. Um, we'll do 12 labs over the course of the semester. In your syllabus, they are simply listed as 1 through 12. Um, that's not very informational. That's because uh, we haven't quite got our act together as to exactly which labs we're going to do. But we'll do 12 of them. And I will make sure that we update this as soon as we can. Remember, especially in organic lab, you need to use goggles. We will have gloves available and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but you do have to get your own goggles. Um, very important. Use lots of toxic chemicals. And you really don't want those spilling all over yourself. Make sure you can go to Blackboard. Um, this actually might be the wrong URL now. But if you just go to the Triton site, you can click on Blackboard and it will take you there. Make sure you can log in and whatever. All of the lectures um, are recorded. So every word that we say, now you know this, um, every word that we say here and all the slides um, show up as a movie. And um, usually, oh maybe the day after lecture, I'll manage to get the thing edited and put up there's a link to it on Blackboard. So you go to Blackboard under Lecture Recordings. You can click on it, and you can relive the experience. It's, it's a very nice thing. Um, so make sure you can get there. We'll use this for um, exams, or quizzes. Um, your grades will be posted on Blackboard, and of course, handouts. Uh, we have a syllabus. Now, this syllabus that you have is a very tentative syllabus. Uh, I actually prepared it last night and um, looking at the Triton schedule was disappointed because we have 13 chapters to do and we have 13 weeks to do them and that doesn't give us time for exams, does it? So that's real disappointing. But, so I had to drop the number of exams from three to two. Um, when you look at the syllabus here, when you see quizzes, um, it only shows two. <laughs> but I'm going to up that, I think, to at least four. So percentages will stay the same, total points will change. But I think that we need a little more practice if we're only going to have time for two exams. 
Um, if you've never done this before, the blackboards are the quizzes are on blackboard. Um, they are typically multiple choice, fill in the blank sort of thing. Um, I will give you two or three attempts at every quiz. Blackboard will save your highest score. The questions from the quizzes come from pools. So everyone, every time you take this, you will get a different set of questions. And everyone in the class will also get different quizzes every time. Um, and it's graded automatically. Again, Blackboard keeps your highest score. And um, it's very important when you do this that you have a nice, happy, stable internet connection because if you're doing it and something bad happens, Blackboard considers that that you have logged out and quite often will not let you log back in, ever. So you have to write me. Um, I can go there. I can fix it. But you know, just make sure that you do it carefully. Like I say, the points have changed here, or will change. Um, we're going to have two exams still, 150 each, and probably four quizzes, maybe, uh, maybe even more. I'm not quite sure yet. So we'll just do this in real time. Um, <clears throat> this, as it sits, gave 660 points. Typically, we split at 90, 80, 70, 60, and that's been no problem in the past. So, any questions on the basic structure? We'll kind of revise this as we go in real time, and I will give you updates to the syllabus and stuff um, as they become available. Any questions? All right. Let's go ahead and start with chapter 12. <clears throat> now, if you did not take organic from me, uh, organic one, we are assuming that you <clears throat> went through the moral equivalent of the first 11 chapters of organic. So that's all of the um, <clears throat> reactions, reaction mechanisms, etc., of alkenes, alkynes, and some basic stuff on halides, nomenclature, and whatever. If you haven't um, <clears throat> looked at those in a while, if you want to review them, on the Blackboard site, I will put up these lecture recordings from the summer session. So in the summer, we did the first 11 chapters. So <clears throat> you can look at those. You can look at the exam reviews all of those things if you want, just to see what things are like. All right, infrared spectroscopy. This little wiggly line that's being generated here is an infrared spectrum. Um, <clears throat> that machine over there, right there, that's a little Fourier transform IR. We used it a little bit in the lab um, in Organic One. <coughs> the labs, one of the reasons we're having trouble with the labs for Organic Two is that they're not really using spectroscopy very much. And we should, because at this point, you should be able to do this. So we're trying to modify the labs as we can to make it so that we can do more things. When you look at an infrared spectrum, it looks like just a whole bunch of little wiggly lines and stuff like that. And it is. Each of these corresponds to an absorption of energy. And there are two ways that you can approach spectroscopy in general. One is you can become a spectroscopist. And a spectroscopist will sit there and look at these things and basically analyze every little wiggle along the way. And you can. And people are very, very good at it. People can spend their life doing things like this. That's it. And they're very, very good at it. Our approach is going to be different. Um, we are going to do what I refer to as practical spectroscopy. Now, we're going to do 
of IR, mass spectrometry, C13, and proton <coughs> NMR. NMR is chapter 13. <clears throat> Each of these will give you a bit of information about a compound very, very easily, quickly, easily, simply. So you can look at the spectrum and say a few things about it. What you'll see is that if you combine the easy information from IR, mass spec, um, and NMR, if you combine all these together, that you can take the easy stuff out of each and actually come up with a unique structure for your compound. Very simple, very practical way to do that. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Infrared spectroscopy. Basically, in the machine, you're going to be shining light uh, of about this wavelength. 2 to 15 microns. Um, <clears throat> micron is a measure of length, isn't it? 10 to the minus 6 meters. If you converted that into centimeters and it took its reciprocal, don't ask me why in the world somebody did this, but you wind up with a unit known as a reciprocal centimeter or a wave number. Wave numbers are often used in organic chemistry um, because they're actually easier to remember than fractional um, wavelengths. 2.76, uh -uh. 3,000, much easier. So <clears throat> we'll talk about um, wave numbers. Remember, both scales are entirely equivalent. Now what happens in IR is that a molecule will absorb a quantum of energy when it's exactly the right wavelength, exactly the right energy. It will excite a movement in the molecule. Typically we're going to be dealing with stretches. Um, IR also excites bending and wagging and wiggling and breathing and all of that stuff. That's much more complicated. This is actually water, but um, this is a bending vibration here, calisthenics. Again, uh, these are stretchings. This is symmetric and asymmetric. We'll talk about those. These all occur at different wavelengths because it takes a unique energy to excite them. Start here with a symmetric CH stretch. When we're talking about a symmetric stretch, what we mean is that both bonds are being stretched in the same direction at the same time. For CH, this occurs at about 2850 reciprocal centimeters. Looks something like this. And it'll show up in the infrared as an absorption because your molecule will absorb this quantum of energy. Um, your machine detects that some of the energy has been absorbed and converts it to that little wriggly line. Symmetric stretch, about 2850. The asymmetric stretch, where they stretch at opposite directions at the same time, occurs at slightly higher wave numbers at about 29.25. Now we're not really going to remember these things with this sort of detail. We're going to work through the spectrum bit by bit <coughs> just with general absorbance bands. Let's go and let's look at the spectrum we started with. This is polystyrene. When you do simple infrared, what you do is you have to calibrate your machine. And a uh, polystyrene film is very often used. And this little peak right here, this guy, occurs exactly at 1601 reciprocal centimeter. So in a much more manual machine, you would take and you would adjust your printout, if you will, 
so that this occurs at the exact wavelength. These are all absorbances as a function of either wavelength or reciprocal centimeters, wave number. We talked about the symmetric and asymmetric stretches. Here we have the asymmetric and the symmetric, again about 29 and 2800 reciprocal centimeters. Any questions? All right. Well, let's pretend that we had this. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say. We're mostly going to deal with stretches. Stretches, um, we're dealing with carbon hydrogen stretching, OH stretching, NH. Um, we'll have triple bond stretches, double bond stretches, carbonyls, etc. Those typically occur above 1,500 reciprocal centimeters. Down in this region, you start getting the bending and the wagging and the wiggling and all of those things. Now those are very, very interesting, but it's very, <coughs> very difficult to diagnose. Because of that, this is referred to as the fingerprint region. If you have a known sample of a compound and you have an unknown and they have the same spectrum in the fingerprint, that's a pretty good match good evidence that you have the same compound. We will look at some of the bands down here, but not many. All right, for polystyrene, if we looked at this spectrum, we would look and say, okay, polystyrene doesn't have, or really just has, a benzene ring. These are hydrogens attached to sp squared carbons. And these are hydrogens attached to sp cubed carbons. Down at this region, at the very bottom end, or the very top end of the spectrum, high energy end, is where we would see stretchings from OHs and NHs. <clears throat> we'll look at this in more detail in a minute. But these guys right in here. Now, if you look at polystyrene, there's no peak. And that's consistent with the fact that we have no OH, and certainly no NH, in polystyrene. <clears throat> At about 3100 is where we get stretching of CH bonds that are attached to sp squared carbons. Now, in the IR, this 3000 line is kind of a very useful magic line. At the high end of that is where we're going to see sp squared CH. And as we saw, when you get below 3,000, this is where we get the sp cubed CH. So for the sp squared, going back one, 3,100 or so, we do have a nice peak. And that's consistent with the CHs on the ring. Again, these are the asymmetric and symmetric CHs from the top part of the polymer. Aldehydes have a very low CH stretch. This occurs about 28, 2750, usually two peaks. Um, we will we'll look at these, but Polystyrene, of course, does not have an aldehyde. We have no peaks here, etc. Our triple bonds are going to come in this region. No triple bonds in polystyrene. Carbonyl. The reason the infrared was invented originally was to look at carbonyls, carbon oxygen double bond. This is typically the dominant peak in any spectrum of a compound that has a carbonyl. <clears throat> very intense, very broad, very, very diagnostic. Again, no carbonyls here and no P. Now these little guys up here we'll talk about in a bit, but these don't really count as peaks. 1600 
and actually these guys in here too, are consistent with the carbon-carbon stretching of a benzene ring. <clears throat> Typically, they'll occur as a bunch. Again, we'll talk about that in just a second. So what I'd like to do is to go and start up here again at the very high energy part. And let's look at all of the functional groups. And let's look at examples of all of these stretches. On the very top end, we have stretchings of OH and NH. Now going way, way back here. We all remember that alcohols and amines can undergo hydrogen bonding. Because of that, each of these OH bonds is fairly unique. Now remember, this bond is absorbing a quantum of energy. A hydrogen bonded OH will absorb at a different wavelength than a non-hydrogen bonded OH. Because of that, we tend to get lots and lots and lots of different OH absorptions when we have something like an alcohol. Because of that, we get a very, very intense but broad peak. This is 2-propanol. This is the OH peak from 2-propanol. And again, it is so broad because all of these are unique OH stretches. And they all occur at slightly different wavelengths and just blend into this nice big lump. When you have an alcohol in your compound, you expect a big, broad peak somewhere in the region of about 3,400. Now, you can actually see a real OH stretch if you go and you look in the gas phase. This is 2-propanol in the gas phase. In the gas phase, we have a very clean, very sharp OH stretch. This is all about, it looks like 3650 or something like that. <clears throat> In the gas phase, you don't have hydrogen bonding. When we do have hydrogen bonding, again, remember, we get lots and lots of different ones, so it broadens way out. You can play games with alcohols sometimes. If we take an alcohol and put it in a solvent like carbon tetrachloride, very nonpolar, and we make our concentration very low, You'll still get some hydrogen bonding, but you can actually sometimes see both the bonded and the non-bonded OH. So they're always there, but <clears throat> typically this is what we're going to see when we look at an alcohol. Any questions? Carboxylic acids are the absolute king of hydrogen bonding. Even in the gas phase, these guys can find each other. <clears throat> um, because of that, we get an absolutely huge um, OH stretching band. In fact, it's so big and so ugly that it essentially wipes out everything else in this region. Um, you can use this to your advantage if you have a carboxylic acid and you have an IR spectrum that's just really, really ugly in this region. That's good evidence that it's a carboxylic acid. Really broad, really ugly. Amines. Amines also have NHs, but they're not as good at hydrogen bonding as alcohols are. Because of that, the bands are not quite as broad. In fact, we can typically pick out symmetric and asymmetric stretches. If we look here at benzylamine, just like this was a CH2, we would expect to get symmetric and asymmetric. 
And we do. That's what these two bands are in this region. <clears throat> this is 4-methyl aniline. Again, we expect to get symmetric and asymmetric. We do. And here is simply in methyl aniline. <clears throat> we only have one hydrogen, and we get one nice band. Now, life is not always this kind. <clears throat> Quite often, you won't see both peaks down here, but you can in many cases. Um, they occur, again, in the same region. What you need to do is to make sure or find out if your molecule has nitrogen in it. If it has nitrogen or no oxygen, and you have a band down here, suggests that you're looking at an amine. All right, working our way up. This is the unsaturated CH, we'll call it. These are CH stretches of alkenes, alkynes, and aromatic rings. Um, the champion here is going to be the alkene CH. We'll see why in a minute, but um, when this is present, you typically alkyne them in. You typically get a big, beautiful, sharp peak um, in the region. Well, this is rather high, so about 3,400 or so. Big, clean, sharp peak. For <coughs> double bonds, when we're looking at this CH, again, if you look at our 3,000 line here, this peak that's just above it represents the sp squared. CH. Now, this one is fairly intense for cyclohexene. If we look here at our benzene ring, we see that this is much less intense. Again, it looks like there's a couple here on the high side of 3,000. Um, we'll see examples of spectra. Sometimes you can see this, sometimes you can't. But if you think you have uh, a double bond in your molecule, you're actually looking for something in this region. We talked about saturated or SP cube CHs. <clears throat> Once again here, we have a simple alkyl halide, um, no double bonds. Everything here you'll note is above 3,000. Nice magic line here, it really is. Methyl cyclohexane. Everything above 3,000. Here we have cyclohexene. Again, you can see the unsaturated or SP squared CH, and here's our saturated CH there. Moving up, aldehydes. <clears throat> if you find your compound has a carbonyl, you're going to want to know if it's an aldehyde, ketone, ester, or whatever. Aldehydes make it easy. <clears throat> Nothing else really absorbs as high in the CH region, um, about 2750 or so, usually two peaks. You can usually see them, and again, they're diagnostic of the aldehyde CH stretch. Thiols. I don't know how much you know about thiols, but they really stink. They really stink. If you have a, an unknown as a thiol, you already know it. But if you take the IR spectrum <clears throat> at about oh, 2,500 or so, 2,550 maybe, you'll see an SHP. We're not going to deal with many thiols, but it isn't going to be a big spot. Once again, if you ever work with benzene thiol, it will get into your skin, into your fat, and you will smell like benzene thiol for months and months afterwards. Not a pleasant thing. It's a little of average. <coughs> Triple bonds. Done with our hydrogen switches now. Here we have carbon nitrogen or nitrile and carbon-carbon, or an alkyne. The winner here clearly 
is going to be the nitrile. If you have a nitrile in your, com in your compound, at about 2250 or so, you should get a nice, clean, sharp peak. Again, this is simply stretching the triple bond. This is a simple alkyne. You'll note that we also see a nice, um, fairly sharp peak here. But if you look at this guy, that's our peak. The triple bond peak can be um, deceptive. That is, it can be there, it could not be there. The reason is actually buried in the theory behind infrared spectroscopy. In order for an absorbance to occur in the IR, you must have asymmetric substitution around the bond you're stretching. Okay? So we're going to stretch our triple bond here. And you look and you say, what's on one side? Well, this is a hydrogen, this is a carbon. That means that this is IR active. And you should see it. If, however, you have the same thing on both sides, symmetry demands that there is no dipole moment and therefore no IR absorbance. So you could have a triple bond and not see it at all. Most commonly, we get something called pseudosymmetric. Pseudosymmetric. Well, the ethyl and the methyl are different, aren't they? But they're close enough. This will show up as a very, very weak infrared peak, <clears throat> again, making it very difficult to see. The winner here, once again, is going to be the nitrile. Um, <clears throat> if you have a nice unsubstituted alkyne, you can see those pretty nicely. But once you start sticking things on them, they pretty much disappear. Carbonyl, like I said, this is why they invented infrared. <clears throat> Carbonyl, speaking of asymmetry here, right? We have an oxygen and a carbon. They're very different. And because of that, when we excite that, we get this huge band, typically around 1700-ish. If you have a nice big broad band in the 1700 region, that tells you you have a carbonyl in your compound. Now, the exact wave number varies depending upon what's substituted on it. We haven't talked about acyl derivatives and their reactivity yet, but we will. <coughs> but the trend here in the IR is that the more reactive an acyl compound is, the higher the wave number, the higher the energy. The least reactive of all the acyls is the amid, it's the lowest wave number. And the most reactive is going to be acyl halides, and they're of about 1,800. <clears throat> Again, they're all in this region. They're all going to be very big, very intense. Can't miss them. Carbon carbon stretch. Carbon carbon stretch. We have the same problem with symmetry that we did with alkynes. Here we have a nice terminal alkyne, again about 1650 or so, nice peak. This guy, we have carbons all the way around, and it's just an ugly little peak. Same sort of problem here. This is pseudosymmetric. <clears throat> here we would have no absorbance. We would have no absorbance at all. This guy, we have pseudosymmetry, and we have this little tiny lump. Depending on what's attached to your alkene, you can either see it or not. Remember when we were, we were looking at polystyrene? We said that in the region here for benzene rings, this is the guy that's always there at 1601. 
But typically, benzene rings will have all three or four bands in this region. You'll look at the spectra that you'll be able to look at this one day and say, yeah, that kind of looks like a benzene ring to me. Again, three or four spectra are three or four peaks, starting at about 16, ending maybe at about 14, 15. You might wonder about these things, these guys here. Those are actually overtones of um, <clears throat> bending, wagging bands that occur way down here at low energy. But for a mono-substituted um, benzene, these are somewhat diagnostic. You expect a handful of peaks looking like a hand right up there, coupled with two great big peaks down here, seven or 800. Um, we're not going to look at those very much. But if you see them and you wonder what in the world they are, that's it. Now the last stretch that we're going to look at is CO. Now this occurs down in uh, the fingerprint region. So we're really not going to look at this very much because there's so much that can occur down here. So you look at this backwards. If you have a compound with a CO in it, then you darn well better have a peak in this region. Doesn't work the other way around. If you see a peak in this region, that doesn't tell you it's necessarily a CO. Any questions? All right, how in the world do you take all this information and make something of it. Well, actually, it's much easier than you might think. You start off with a spectrum and an analysis. <coughs> now, what we're going to do is start with the analysis. Remember degrees of unsaturation? It seemed like kind of a silly little calculation that you did. It told you the number of rings or double bonds that were in a compound. In terms of analytical information, that can be really useful. <clears throat> this compound has three carbons. Remember for a simple alkane, the number of hydrogens would be 2n plus 2. We should have eight hydrogens. We have six, so we're missing two. That's one degree of unsaturation. Remember, when you do DU, you ignore oxygen altogether. Just ignore it. So this tells us we have one double bond, a carbonyl, or a ring in our compound. Second thing we do, we're going to start at the top end and we're going to march down. On an exam, <clears throat> I would expect you to do exactly what we're going to do here. You put down information, positive or negative, because it both tells you something, doesn't it? Start up here at 3400. 3,400 right there. We have that little tiny blip. Is that an OH? Absolutely not. Remember, an OH is big and broad. So we say there's no OH in our model. Next, we go down to 3,100. We find our magic 3,000 line. And we say, is there any peak on the high end of that? Nope. But not. No peak suggesting sp squared ch. Now, when we do something like IR, it's not only OK, but it's expected to use words like suggest, maybe, might be, I think, etc. OK? 
2,900, so on the low side of 3,009, we get a nice peak there, saturated or SPQ CH. We don't see anything in our 2,750 area. <clears throat> I didn't put that on the list. On an exam, you could. That would be a good thing to do. <clears throat> Next thing we would do is we would hit our triple bond region. There's nothing to indicate an unsymmetrical triple bond. Carbonyl, big, broad peak right here at 1700 or so. This compound has a carbonyl. Finally, 1610, right here, we see nothing, nothing to suggest a carbon-carbon double bond. All right, so we just read the spectrum. What we found out was, it looks like it's a simple aliphatic carbonyl. In fact, it's a ketone. Now is where you use a little bit of brain power, a little bit. You have three carbons. One of them is a carbonyl. It's a ketone. Only way you can put it together is to make acetone. Only way you can put it together. Oh, you did print the pictures. Good. <coughs> I'm proud of you. Any questions? All right, let's run through a set of five problems or so. <clears throat> These are the kind of things you might see on a quiz or an exam. I'll hush for a second. Figure out how many degrees of unsaturation we have. One. That was fast. We have 14 hydrogens. We only have seven carbons. If it was saturated, we would have 16. That is one du. Arch through your spectrum. 3,400, do we see an OH? That's not an OH. 3,100, do we see SP squared CH? Find your 3,000 line, look at the high side. No, I don't think so. Now you know all these peaks shift a little bit depending on what's attached. So when we say 3,100, you know, there's slop in there, depending on the exact molecule. But that's the region we're looking at. I don't see anything here that looks like SP squared CH. <clears throat> we do have an oxygen. Again, we could have put in that there is no evidence of an aldehyde. <clears throat> 2,900, nice peaks. Nice saturated CH. Twenty-two hundred triple bonds. Nothing there. Seventeen hundred. Way big, happy carbonyl. So this is a ketone, isn't it? Sixteen hundred, right here. There's nothing there, is there? No carbon-carbon double bond. So what have we got? Just like the other example, simple aliphatic ketone. So quickly, write down the structure.
Well, I hope you wrote down at least one of these. Now you see the problem with IR is we now know the functional group, but we don't know very much about the actual structure. What we're going to do in practical spectroscopy is combine mass spec, IR, and I assure you, you could virtually instantly distinguish between all of these. In fact, this is it. It's a uh, dimethyl pentanone, <clears throat> but without looking at the NMR, you would have real trouble. We'll see, even at the mass spec level, you can figure out what this is. Any questions? All right, let me hush for a second. <clears throat> and you do the drill on this. Step one, we have eight carbons. Eight times two is 16, plus two is 18. We have eight hydrogens. <coughs> we should have 18. How many do you use? That's a five. Now, just as a good, healthy guess, whenever you have four or more degrees of unsaturation, that should kind of scream at you, benzene ring. Benzene ring is four. So here we have five. We're probably looking at something with a benzene ring in it. Thirty-four hundred. Don't see anything. 3,100. Yeah, we have some nice little sharp peaks here on the high side of 3,000. Those would be consistent with SP squared CH. Please read the disclaimers suggesting possible. Okay? Look, slightly below 3,000. We see a little tiny peak there that could be possible SP cubed CH. We don't see anything in the aldehyde region. Triple bonds, 2200, there's nothing there. Once again, we have beautiful carbonyl at 1,700. At 1,600, oops, nice sharp peak. And it's got some friends here, 1,400 and above. That kind of is consistent with benzene, SP squared, carbon-carbon <coughs> uh, double bonds. So what we say here is this looks like we have a benzene ring, we have a carbonyl compound, it's a ketone. We have single and double bonds. Now, we have eight carbons, right? Benzene ring is going to take six of them. One of them is going to be a carbonyl. 
There's only one left. It's not an aldehyde. This must be acetophenone. These six must be the benzene ring. One of them must be a carbonyl. And we have the CH3 left over. Now, isn't that fun? This is fun. After a couple hours of study. Yeah. Um, can you say again how we got, okay, we got a benzene ring because of the saturation? Well, we started off by looking at the DUs. There's okay. lots of them. That suggests a benzene ring. Then we say, okay, if we have a benzene ring, we would expect unsaturated CH, and we would expect carbon-carbon double bonds. We see both. So all of this is consistent with this structure. Now, it doesn't prove it, but it's consistent with it. Once again, if you looked at the NMR, it would be unambiguous. <coughs> CH10. How many do you? Eight times two is sixteen plus two is eighteen. We have ten. We have four DUs. Once again, my guess here is that it sounds like it could be a benzene ring. Doesn't prove it, but it could be. Now we look at our IR spectrum. What is this great big ugly thing down here at 3400? That's an OH, isn't it? My gosh, we finally found one. Big, strong OH. 3100. Well, it's tough to tell with this guy in the way, but there is a little peak here which is consistent with SP squared CH. <clears throat> About 2,900. Oh yeah, nice big peak for saturated or SP cubed CH. <clears throat> we have no aldehyde. Triple bond. Nothing. Carbonyl. Nothing at all, is there? No carbonyl band. And finally, 1600 down to 1450. We see at least three bands in there. That's consistent with benzene carbon carbon double bond. So this looks like it has a benzene ring, and it has an OH. Well, benzene ring is going to take up six carbon. That means this two. We know one of them must be bonded to an OH. There are actually two structures you could draw. This is the correct one, but based on the IR, we could not tell the difference between this and an OH bonded here and a methyl here. That's, once again, <clears throat> something we have to use the mass spec and the NMR to tell us. Now, if this was on an exam, on an exam, you will get a mass spec, an IR, C13 data, and proton data. Okay? <clears throat> the entire question is worth 25 points. We're simply writing down this stuff in the IR, that gets you five points. Next one. C 
C887N. How many degrees of unsaturation? Well, this is a little tricky, isn't it? Because remember, nitrogen is funny when it comes to the U. What you do if you have a nitrogen in your compound is because nitrogen is bonded to three things. You subtract one hydrogen for every nitrogen. So this is the moral equivalent of C8H7. Now we should have 18, and we have H6. That means we have an incredible number. We have six degrees of unsaturation. OK. <clears throat> My rule is if you have more than four, you really think benzene ring? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. <coughs> Look at your spectrum. 3,400. See anything? Nope. 3,100. Nice, clean, sharp peak right there. That's good, isn't it? 2,900. Nothing. Triple bond region. Oh my goodness, look at that sharp little peak. After you've done this a while, <clears throat> once you realize your thing has nitrogen, you would look at this and say, oh my goodness, that's a nitrile. Sharp, clean, right in the 2200 region. Seventeen. Carbonyl. Nope. And finally, 16 on down. Well, there's something there, there's something there and there. Yeah, they're there, they're not real impressive. <clears throat> but we can at least get a, a weak bands and say they're consistent with, or suggest, <coughs> or could be, or I think. So this looks like we have a benzene ring, and we have a nitrile. Now we have eight carbons to deal with. If we're going to use six of them in a benzene ring, one of them in a nitrile, we have one left over. This is what it actually is. <clears throat> the one thing that's surprising here is that we would expect to see our saturated CH right in this region, and we don't. Don't know why, but we don't. Once again, if we looked at the NMR, we would know right away that we have a methyl group and we can even tell the substitution pattern on the thing. Last one. C8H8. 8 times 2 is 16, plus 2 is 18. We're missing 10 hydrogens. That's 5 DUs. All right, 3,400, do we see anything? Nope, not at all. 3,100, nice sharp peak right here, just on the high side of 3,000. 
2,900. Yep, we got it. 2,900. Now, what in the world is this at 2,750? Finally, we get to see a real aldehyde. Twenty two hundred. No, triple bond. Seventeen hundred. Nice, sharp carbonyl or broad carbonyl. We know that this carbonyl is an aldehyde. And finally, 1610. Well, here's our 1600. Got another one there, something else here ish. Yeah, that would be consistent with benzene carbon carbon bonds. So we have a benzene ring. We have carbonyl, that's an aldehyde. Six of our carbons goes to the ring. One goes to the aldehyde. It actually is this, but based on the IR, you could not tell if this is a methyl group or if we have a carbon in between these two. Just can't tell. Very frustrating. Now, if we have the mass spec of this, we could tell right away that we had this particular compound and not the other. And so, let's look at the mass spectrum. I'm going to break here for about five minutes so everyone can run and catch a breath, and then we'll pick up and we'll do mass spectrum. Go back. Sure. Once again, these are all recorded, so <clears throat> it's all there. If you, I, there's something I have to write. It's kind of I feel like a process is better than I can go back. So these are all the variables. So I'm going to make a list of every possibility. Like every. Well, or, you know, don't make lists yet. Let's finish NMR. Let's finish chapter 13. And I think by the time we get done with 13, you'll see this really is something. Really is something. Yeah. So Remember, you can also bring a 3 by 5 card, oh, yeah. but after you do this for a while. the only part of pension reform that they ever passed. <laughs> you were my teacher
question. No, it was. Uh, I just have to calm down. That's what it is. Yeah, it's not hard. You'll be amazed. That's what my mother always says. Oh, oh, tired chemists put air ring. No, you know what? <clears throat> oh, 15 years ago, I, I wrote a book <clears throat> that was published along with my mother's book. Well, practical spectroscopy. Why we did this? And it's just so simple. Uh, yeah, you can get it. But um, I'll give you everything. Oh. That's cool. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah, there was a vision. I have like two core vocabulary things like that. Yeah, I do. George, did you ever straighten out your registration? Yeah. Did yeah. you ever show that one? Oh, yeah. I'll check again. Oh, okay. I'll straighten it out. Yeah, well, let me check and I'll see you know. Yeah, because I'm dealing with that lady in the mission. I'll see you. She was supposed to send me something back. I never did. She's everything she's doing. Oh, she did it? Yeah, yeah, she really. I was, I was like running back and forth. Yeah, she got to get told. She got to get together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, she had me running around like back and forth, like during the summer. I was not so. Huh. I had to go to her office like five times because I wasn't showing up on my uh, transcript. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> I'll make sure. is kind of a strange art. In mass spec, what you can do is take a molecule, perfectly good molecule, and you're going to rip it to pieces. And you're going to look at the pieces and see if you can figure out what the pieces tell you about what the molecule used to be. If we start off with something, some molecule of some sort, Call it R. And we take it and we put this in a very intense <coughs> electron field. So we're bombarding this thing with electrons. What happens is organic molecules can lose an electron. Now if we take a neutral molecule and we lose an electron, what happens is we form what's known as a radical cation. Now this will have the same mass as the stuff you started with. Because the electron doesn't weigh very much, we don't really care about it. So this is referred to as a molecular ion. In mass spec, what we're going to do is look at positive things. The molecular ion is typically a radical cation, where we just simply take our parent, and we lose an electron. Mass spec, we're going to be able to look at radical cations and simple cations. If we have a radical cation, one of the things that can happen is this thing can split. We can break a carbon-carbon bond. When we do that, we still have, you know, we're missing one electron, but we still have a positive species. 
<clears throat> this is a cation. Again, this would show up in the mass spec. The radical we wouldn't see, it would just be garbage. Radical cation can also expel a neutral molecule. So when you have this thing, it spits out something that's neutral. We're left with a radical cation. This is simple fragmentation. Um, this is very useful because we know what this thing weighs. We know its mass, molecular weight. <clears throat> the neutral molecule will have a mass associated with it. So when we see how much we've lost, you can work backwards and figure out what was in this molecule that you just lost. We could also take a carbon cation, spit out something neutral, and wind up with a carbon cation. All of these things will show up. These guys are molecular ion minus something or other. Okay, let's look at a real example here. This is benzene ring, methyl group, and an ester. This is a radical cation. So in the mass spec, this has lost an electron. <clears throat> this thing can undergo fragmentation, like we just saw. If we split off our methoxy group here, split off a methoxy radical, so we're losing the methoxy radical, we would be left with all the rest of this as the cation. Now you may notice this carbon-oxygen triple bond. And it's an oxonium ion. Oxonium ions are very stable. Therefore, this is a very stable carbon cation. What we would see here is our molecular ion losing methoxy to form <coughs> this thing. We do this simply as a function of weight. Now it turns out that <clears throat> mass spec can also do really fancy things. <coughs> Don't worry about fancy things, just like we did in NIR. But this can undergo what's known as a McLafferty rearrangement where we actually transfer a hydrogen to the methoxy, we're going to expel our neutral molecule, and we're left with <clears throat> this thing, again, the McLafferty rearrangement. We're left with this as a carbon cation, I'm sorry, radical cation, after we lose the neutral methanol. Now what we see in the mass spec is only mass numbers. So this guy here would have a mass of 150. That's its molecular weight. That's our molecular ion. <clears throat> when we lose the methoxy group, methoxy weighs 31. So the next peak we would see down would be this one with a weight of 119. Going down here, methanol weighs 32. Therefore, we have a peak here at 118. So the trick in a mass spec is you start here with the molecular weight. And you say, OK, we just lost something that weighs 31. What weighs 31? Think about it a little bit. Oh. Methoxy does. And that would give us 119. What weighs 32? Well, that's methanol to give us this. Most of the fragmentations we're going to look at are going to be simpler than this. We're going to lose things like a methyl group that weighs 15. We're going to lose um, a halogen, etc. Nice, simple, straightforward. The mass spec kind of looks like this. 
What you do is you take your compound and you stick it in this is all very high vacuum. You stick a little bit of your compound in here, and I mean a little bit. We're talking, you know, dozens of molecules here. No, not much at all. As it goes in, there's an electron source here that zaps the heck out of it. Lots of things happen when it gets zapped, but one of them is it will lose an electron. All right, so now you have this beam. These are just little slits that straighten it up, so it's going in the right direction. Um, these are all positive fragments, so you make these things negative, so they kind of pull it forward. So now we've got this beam of positive fragments. <clears throat> goes through a magnet. Now what does a magnet do with a positive particle? It will bend its field on it. So this is running through here. The amount that it bends depends upon how much it weighs. If it's a really heavy guy, the magnet's not going to bend it very much. If it's really light, it'll bend it a lot. At the other end, this comes out and you detect each of these bands, you're looking at the molecular weight of all of these fragments. Now, the way you actually do this is slightly different. Um, your magnet isn't a permanent magnet, it's tunable. So you take it and you increase your magnetic field. As it does, this thing swings back and forth, and you read the peaks one at a time. <coughs> what we're going to get here is a mz ratio, mass to charge. As far as we're concerned, charge is always one. So this is simply the mass. When you get all this together, you look at intensity versus mass, and you get what you call a mass spectrum. <coughs> now for the compound we just looked at, Our molecular weight is 150. This is our molecular ion here at 150. Our next peak is the highest peak in the spectrum. That's always called the base peak. And actually what you do is you set this to 100% when you do the scale. This peak at 119 represents loss of this guy, 31. So you look at this and say, well, this is molecular ion, and this is M minus 31. This peak here at 118, M minus 32. Now you get other stuff too, but again, we'll get a look at the simple, common things. Any questions? All right, just like IR, <clears throat> we're going to take this and we're going to use it to get the simple information out. This is simply says what I said. The mass spec gives us the molecular weights of the most stable cationic fragments. So that's what we're looking at. Okay. Toluene. Toluene is methyl benzene. If you add up the molecular weight of methyl benzene, it turns out that its mass is 92. So 92 represents the molecular ion, and that's this guy. The next peak we see, the base peak, is 91. Now that should not surprise you, because if we take this cation radical and we lose a hydrogen, what do we get? We get the benzyl carbo cation, don't we? Remember back to organic one, benzyl carbo cations are very, very, very stable, aren't they? That's why we lose this, 
and form this stable goggle cation. Actually, this isn't a benzyl group here. Remember, benzyl groups can undergo rearrangement quickly to form what's called the tropilium ion. And a mass spec, whenever you see a peak at 91, it tells you you have a benzyl group in your molecule and you're forming the tropilium ion. As an example of exp uh, expelling something neutral, if we take tropilium and we expel two carbons and two hydrogens, that is ethyne, acetylene, we wind up with 65, and there it is down there. A major peak here, a big thing here, is our tropilium. Now, how do you remember what you expel? <clears throat> we have a little table here. Common fragments. Now, you really don't have to write these down or remember them. Um, the ones that are obvious, we'll just use all the time. Obviously, if we lose one like we just did, that's a hydrogen. If we lose 15, that's a methyl group. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OH is 17. Ethoxy, as we saw, was 31. Halogens. Remember, bromine consists of two, is two isotopes, 79 and 81, average 80. Chlorine air, again, two isotopes. Iron and only one at 127. These are common things that you'll see split out of a molecular. Things that you form. This is really stable. Basically, it's formaldehyde with a proton ion. <clears throat> it's an oxonium ion, once again, um, and it weighs 31. The real key thing I want you to remember, though, is 43. 43 to 91. Those are the important ones. 43 either represents an isopropyl carbocation, secondary carbocation, or the acylium ion. If you see a peak at 43, you're talking about these guys. Obviously, 91, tropilium, or benzyl. <clears throat> Again, this is uh, formaldehyde with a proton, the isopropyl or cation, or the psyllium ion, and finally, tropilium, telling you you have a bit. Now, as complicated as all this seems, you'll be amazed how easily you can take um, a mass spec and actually say a lot about a simple compound. So let's do one. If we look at this, after we get over the initial fright, we would say, well, this must be our molecular ion, here about 58-ish. We have a big peak here, our base peak, at 43. That's an M minus 15. 58 minus 15 is 43. Now, this is going to be our molecular weight. This is our most stable carbocation. Okay. <clears throat> our molecular weight is 58. We have a loss of a methyl group. <coughs> and our stable ion has a mass of 43. If I tell you that this is C4H10, well, what's the first thing you do? You say 2 times 4 is 8, plus 2 is 10. How many degrees of unsaturation? None. 
Therefore, no oxygen. This is not a psyllium. This is simply isopropyl. If we had a carbonyl to make it in a psyllium, we would not only have an oxygen here, but we would have one D. All right, now what's the structure? We can actually deduce that. <coughs> we have four carbons to work with. Here are three. What did we lose to make this? Lost a methyl. Where are you going to put it? There. And we have two methyl propane. So that would be the parent? This would be the parent one? Yeah, this is the compound. Okay. So if we lose an electron from this, that's an electron <coughs> ion. Now if you're really picky, look at this. Here's our molecular ion of 58. <clears throat> we have something else here, maybe 59-ish, don't we? Why in the world do we have that? Because carbon has isotopes, doesn't it? So some of this stuff has a little bit of carbon-13 in it. So its actual weight would be 59. So you'll always see isotopes slightly above the molecular ion. All right, well, that was simple. Look at this one. Oh my gosh, it's deja vu all over again. Peak at 58, peak at 53. This is our molecular ion. This is M minus 15, and it's our base peak. Just like last time, our molecular weight is 58. Lost the methyl, and we formed a 43. Now, if I tell you the analysis is C3H6O, you would immediately say, what do you And if I tell you that the IR has a big peak at 1745, what would you say? Oh my goodness, it's a ketone. It's a what? Ketone. Has to be. How do we know it's not an aldehyde? Because if you had an aldehyde, we would lose a hydrogen, and we would have a stable peak at 57. All right. So that means that this is the acyllium ion. Methyl, carbon, triple bond, oxygen. It weighs 43. So what's our structure here? Well, we take our acyllium ion and we put a methyl on it. Only one way to do it, and that makes acetone. Now, for a simple compound, isn't this incredibly simple? Any questions? The more you do with these, the easier they get. So let's do another one. Now we have lots of these. In order to get your five points on an exam, <coughs> you would have to identify 120 as a molecular ion. 105 is our base peak, isn't it? What did we lose? 15. It's going to be a methyl group we lost. And we formed something down here that weighs 77. Turns out, 77 
Take 120, subtract 77, what do you get? 43. Isn't it amazing how these numbers keep coming up? So based on this, our molecular weight is 120. We lost a methyl group. We lost 43 to form 77. <coughs> if I tell you we have a big strong peak in the IR at 1725, that's going to tell you we have a keto, right? Not an aldehyde because we would have M minus 1. Our analysis, C8HAO. That's 5DU, isn't it? So we're thinking about a benzene ring. <coughs> All right. Our 43 that we lost, that's going to be an acillium, isn't it? Because we're dealing with a carbonyl compound. Now, if we think, if we guess, that we have a benzene ring here because of our degrees of unsaturation, what does a benzene ring weigh? Seventy-seven. Now we're missing a hydrogen here, otherwise it'd be seventy-eight. But a benzene ring with something used to be attached weighs seventy-seven, the carbocation. Now, if we have an acylium ion and a benzene ring, six carbons, seven carbons, eight. That's all of them. What is this? It's a cytophenone, of course. We can split off our methyl group to make 105, or we can split off a psyllium to make 77. Any question? But did you say that time you said it wasn't for an Well, it's not an aldehyde <clears throat> because if we had hydrogen here, instead of M minus 15, we would have an M minus 1. And we don't see that. Now, you see, if you had the IR, you would know right away if it was an aldehyde or a ketone simply from the peak at 2750. That's why it's so simple, if you have all of them, to figure out from the easy stuff what you've got. This peak here, where well, we lost 15, once again, this is our oxonium ion. <clears throat> Cleave this off, very stable carbocation. these down here, 172 and 170, both of those are molecular ions. Our base peak here is 91. Oh my gosh, what's that? That's going to be our propylium ion, isn't it? And if you take the average here and subtract 91 from it, you get 80. So this is an M minus 80. <clears throat> this makes sense. Well, let's just do it this way. Molecular weights, 170, 172. You're going to lose 80. 91 is going to be our trophy. 
All of this makes sense if I tell you this is C7H7Br. Why? Because like I said, bromine has an average atomic weight of 80. But it actually consists of two isotopes, <clears throat> bromine 79 and 81, and they're at equal concentrations. So we always see two peaks, same intensity, if you have a bromine. Average is 80, therefore M minus 80 gives us tropilia. So let's put this together. This used to be a benzyl group. We had a bromine attached. Only way they go together is to make benzyl bromide. Now, the isotope stuff here works really well for bromine and chlorine. Bromine, we have equal concentrations, so we'll always get an M and an M plus 2. Average is in, right in between, M plus 1. Chlorine, <coughs> we have two peaks. Um, chlorine, we have a 3 to 1 ratio. I forget the numbers. Chlorine. I guess 34 and 37, something like that. Whatever. But again, 3 to 1, bromine is always 1 to 1. All right. Let's just end up by doing one very simple problem where we have both. IR and an MR. I'm sorry, IR and a mass spec. <clears throat> Here is our mass spec. Analysis is C5H10O. Here is our NMR. Start with the mass spec. Well, nope, we're going to start with the analysis, aren't we? Always do. How many degrees of unsaturation? Exactly. <coughs> and 2 times 5 is 10, plus 2 would be 12. We have 10 of them. We have 1 degree of unsaturation. One ring, one double bond, could be a carbon. Our mass spec. <coughs> Our molecular ion here is 86. We have a peak here at 71. What is that? 86 minus 71 is a 15. We just lost the methyl group, didn't we? <clears throat> we have a peak here at 43. That is either going to be <clears throat> the isopropyl carbocation or <coughs> Now, you know, just based on this, we could guess what the structure is right now. But we don't have to guess, do we? Because we have the IR. Based on the mass spec, molecular weight is 86. We can lose a methyl group with a stable carbon cation. Peak at 43 is either isopropyl or acylic. Quickly run through the IR. What do we see at 3,400? That. Is that an OH peak? That's not an OH peak. No. Thirty-one hundred. Do we see anything? Nothing. Nothing. 
2900. Big, happy, saturated CH. We don't see anything at 2750. I didn't put it down. On an exam, you could have. You should have. So we know it's on an aldehyde. We actually know that from the mass spec. Because no win minus one. <clears throat> 2200. No triple bonds. 1700. Big, happy, fat carbonyl. And finally, 1600. Nope, nothing there. All right, so what do we know? We know we have a carbonyl. Carbonyl is probably a ketone. We know like the weight, we know we can clip off a methyl group. This is going to be either isopropyl or a psyllium. So, what is it? What's our compound? We have a ketone, so you know I would pretty much bet on this fragment being in there, right? The methyl group, well, we can clip this thing off. That makes sense. What are we missing? That's two carbons, right? So that's those or three, uh, two carbons and an oxygen. So we're missing three carbons. How could you put those together? You could put them that way in a line. We're missing the three carbons. Or we could do it this way. Now, based on the simple analysis that we've done, based on the simple stuff, you really would have to guess between these two. You'd have to guess. In fact, this is this guy right here. The reason that we have such a nice big peak at 43 is that we're splitting here to make both isopropyl and acylium. Going back to what I said here, if we had done chapter 13 by now, we would simply look at the NMR and instantly everybody in this room would say it's this guy. Instantly. Because the NMR spectrum from this and this are going to be so totally different. Now isn't that something to look forward to? You can hardly wait for chapter 13, where we're going to do NMR. And that will be actually in a long time, won't it? Have a question? Yeah. Um, going back to the mass effects. Yeah. This one, you mean? Yeah. Okay. So in this, carbon like Orion here is 86. Okay, we do have an oxygen. We have one DU. Probably dealing with a carbon. We don't have an N minus one. 
Add an aldehyde, and we'll see some later. An aldehyde will give us an M minus one. Probably we're dealing here with an acylium ion that weighs 43. So here we have split off a methyl group and we form one of these things. When we look at the uh, IR, we have our big thing here is this ketone, carbonyl, no aldehydes. So we're dealing with a psyllium ion, loss of a methyl, that's it, and our base B. Now again, we have to guess, because it could be either of these. But the NMR will tell you instantly the difference between them. And it'll be just as simple as this one. All right, on Thursday or uh, Wednesday, um, we're going to have a very compromised period. I apologize. We're going to do nothing more than fill out our yellow form and watch our 30 minute video on lab safety. If you've been here before, you've seen this video so many times, you are really tired of it. <laughs> I am too, but we have to do that. Um, <clears throat> the way the semester is structured, we, uh, we are not set up to do the first lab yet. So first lab, called lab number one, because we haven't identified it yet, is going to be the following week. Following Monday, unfortunately, is Labor Day. So everybody's going to be out laboring. And we're not going to have class. So we have to wait two weeks, I guess, before we get to do NMR. I will put the handout up, and you can download it this time and print it. <clears throat> because as for bigger spectra, really are easier to see. Uh, so do that before we do the NMR. After we do the NMR chapter, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to squeeze it in, but I have a nice set of slides where we're going to do seven to ten examples where we're given IR, NMR, mass spec, C13 NMR,